Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the post-lunch most exciting presentation there is. <laughs> I'm Joe Scanlon, I am one of five uh, NESHAP asbestos inspectors for the DEQ. Uh, my territory is the whole Upper Peninsula and most of Northern Lower. Um, I actually did give this presentation in April, I think, of this year in Gaylord. So if some of you might have seen this, I'm not sure. Um, basically, I'm going to end up flying through this. I usually have a, over an hour to start the presentation with kind of going over the, <coughs> the basics of uh, who regulates asbestos. Uh, there's two entity, entities in the state of Michigan. Uh, there's DEQ, and there's our asbestos niche app program, and then there's Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs. Uh, they operate the MyOSHA portion of it, which uh, you'll see in a minute here, focuses mostly on worker safety, whereas I focus mostly on waste handling and disposal technique. So it can get a little confusing between the two. Yep, there we go. Uh, so Michigan was granted authority by the US EPA uh, to uh, enforce uh, their NESHAP asbestos program. They monitor us, uh, they require us to submit annual reports. Um, outside of us, EPA can come in and do their own inspections on, and they have in the state of Michigan. Um, they tend to not communicate with us when they do that sometimes. <laughs> sometimes they just show up and, and take over. Uh, but for the most part, 95% of asbestos cases in the state are handled by DEQ. Uh, the state of Michigan adopted the NESHAP uh, by reference. <laughs> you guys can come on in. Everybody's, everybody's probably familiar with asbestos because of these billboards like this that you see all over the state. And all over the country, really. Uh, <coughs> these midi or these uh, asbestos law attorneys, they have a pretty good business going. Uh, what is asbestos? It's a naturally occurring mineral. Uh, it's actually a wonderful product when it's used correctly. Unfortunately, it was not used correctly or handled correctly over the last hundred years, or probably much longer than that. Uh, the big problem with asbestos is that it's crystallized uh, mineral. The crystals are very long. Uh, they're very minute. They're five microns, much smaller than the human eye can see. And the problem is once they become airborne, uh, they can stay airborne for a very extended period of time. Uh, and once they get into your lungs or your respiratory system, uh, it's very difficult for them to be removed uh, most time, they end up staying in place. And what happens then is they can scar your uh, tissue of your lungs, and that's where you get asbestosis uh, or mesothelioma. A mesothelio mesothelioma is actually a cancer. Asbestosis is kind of more about around like emphysema. Uh, this is a picture of chrysolite, I believe. Uh, this is what it looks like in its natural state. You can actually find outcroppings of this exposed in uh, Las, or outside Las Vegas in Henderson, Nevada. There is actual rocks of this just laying around on the ground. Um, and as you would expect, mesothelioma and asbestosis case, cases are much higher there than anywhere else in the country. Does that, does that get airborne and mm -hmm. cause problems? Just in fact, uh, <coughs> The Los, or Nevada Highway Department wanted to put a highway through here, and I think they had to reroute the whole thing because there was so much surface contamination of asbestos that it would have been a nightmare. So what's applicable to the niche app? Uh, there's three main questions we go over. Is the facility subject? Is the activity subject? And are the materials subject, uh, the materials that are going to be handled? Uh, there's friable asbestos containing material, which is basically your, your powdered, uh, can be anything that's pulverized by hand pressure or crushed. 
Uh, Non-friable is typically your floor tiles, uh, asphalt building products, things that generally cannot be crushed by hand pressure. Um, it's very basic. Uh, it's either can be crushed by hand pressure, cannot be crushed by hand pressure. Um, but there's also different things about friable where non-friable can become friable if it's sanded or ground uh, releasing fibers. Two types of non-friable asbestos containing material, uh, category one, category two. Category one is uh, gaskets, packings, uh, floor covering, like your vinyl sheet flooring, vinyl tiles, uh, asphalt roofing products. Category two is anything else, like transite siding. Uh, transite siding is a tricky one because it can easily become friable just by breaking apart. So that's your definitions of your types of asbestos, two kinds, friable, non-friable. Uh, facility types, I, the niche app does not handle anything residential that has less than four units. If it's an apartment building with more than four units, then it falls under the niche app program. Other than that, any commercial, institutional, it all falls under the niche app. So privately owned, residential, I don't even address. Now, my OSHA, on the other hand, they do, but that's typically only if there's a contractor involved. Uh, if it's just a residential homeowner that's stripping uh, asbestos out of their house, nobody has any control over that. It's kind of a free-for-all. But as soon as there's a contractor that's got employees where somebody's getting paid, my OSHA does get involved. Uh, so surprisingly, ships are fall under the asbestos program for the niche app. Uh, most people don't realize that ships were loaded with asbestos, uh, with thermal uh, insulation on the pipes, uh, a lot of transite siding in the ships. Uh, boats are actually just floating, floating pods of asbestos. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> no. And uh, other interesting structures are culverts, bridges. Uh, you can have slip joints between the bridge decking and the frame of the bridge that are sometimes asbestos containing expansion joints uh, between the bridge decking and the roadway. The sealants that they used to install those were often uh, had high, high concentrations of asbestos. And that's something where constantly having problems with contractors is trying to convince them that they need to do asbestos inspections on a bridge or a culvert because it's kind of hard to, to understand that logic. Um, once subject, always subject. It's kind of an interesting part of the niche app. So if you had a, I don't know what's a good example, like a school that was converted into uh, residential units or, or something like that uh, that had less than four, four dwelling units in it, it would still be under the niche app program, even though, even if all that asbestos had been removed or abated. Uh, if a wall comes down and it's privately owned, and even if it's residential, uh, it still falls under the niche app. It doesn't happen very often where we come across that. Uh, so just some examples of what falls under there. Bridges, tunnels, dock ships. Lots of military installations are loaded with asbestos. Um, that is a big problem. And then privately owned, privately controlled structures, like I said earlier, are exempt. Unless it's owned or controlled by a government entity, which is where we get into the blight programs, blight removal programs that you're seeing, you've seen a lot of in Detroit and Flint. Uh, those are considered projects. So anytime there's more than one house involved, uh, it becomes a project. And a project does fall under the niche app if it's municipal owned. Uh, if there is a single house, um, that's not part of a large project. It does not fall under the niche app, so <laughs> it can get a little confusing sometimes. So then no 10-day notification is needed if it's a residence? 
if it's a residence and it's not part of a larger project, if it's just a one-off house, uh, then no. Even if government owned, but this is where it gets tricky because a project can be any length of time. So if you're a county land bank and say you only got grant funding to knock down a single house, but you intend on knocking down other houses, then you have a project. <laughs> so it gets a little, it can get a little ridiculous. Essentially, just fill out the notification anyway. It's what about fire training? Because don't we ask for an asbestos survey? We, we do, do for intentional burns. Yeah. House, yeah, generally. Yeah, that's a little different. Fire trainings are different. Okay. Yeah, because we do require them to to notify. But that's coming up here too. So activities that are subject: renovations and de uh, demolitions. What's a renovation? Uh, a renovation is basically altering any facility component that might have asbestos containing material on it. Uh, and that's anything from floor tile removal to removal of uh, thermal insulation on pipes, boiler uh, abatements, anything like that would be considered a renovation. Uh, if it falls below the threshold required here, which is 260 for linear feet. Linear feet, we usually, that's like say for pipe insulation on piping, you would measure that in linear feet. Or 160 square feet, which typically would be drywall, plaster, uh, that kind of thing. 35 cubic feet, uh, which is pretty rare. We usually only see that in facilities where somebody had come in and ripped off a bunch of pipe wrap and it's laying in the pile on a floor. And then you, you kind of guess and be like, well, it looks like 35 cubic feet. I guess I better get my notification in. But if it's, if it's smaller than any of those numbers, you don't have to submit your notification. Anything larger though, or if it meets that threshold, you do have to submit a notification. Demolitions are pretty straightforward. It's remo removing, removal of a load bearing structure. So any load-bearing wall, column, uh, anything like that automatically constitutes as a demolition. Uh, have to fill out a notification, no matter what. Intentional burns of any facility, as Janice was saying, uh, whether it was residential, municipal owned, doesn't matter who owns it. If it's getting burned, it has, they have to notify. Um, Probably don't see that too often in this area. We have it a lot in the UP. Um, you guys do? Probably yeah, in, the, in the outside Traverse area, but it's a good training exercise. We only allow it for fire training exercises. You can't just say, I want to burn my house. Uh, <laughs> it, has, it has to be, uh, yeah. Does it delineate, you know, there's times where you do fire training where the intent is to burn the structure down. Right. Like smoke training or? Not even smoke training, but say you're, you're doing it for like research. Like say you're trying to recreate a scenario. Uh, and you're, you're not intending to burn the structure down, you're intending to recreate a series of events. Like a forensics kind of right. thing, something like that? Yeah. I think we would allow that. I mean, That's still considered. as long as there is a legit purpose for the burning. Right. And it's not just, hey, we got a bunch of beer and some hot dogs and we want to <laughs> see this thing go to the ground. Um, but it is great fire training practice for rural fire departments because a lot of times these guys are volunteer units and they don't see a lot of action. Yeah, they don't get a lot of opportunity. Um, so usually when we do see an intentional burn, it's, it's uh, more than one fire department. They usually get adjoining townships together and kind of do a big training where they do shuttle, water shuttling and it's, it's pretty interesting actually. <coughs> Demolitions and intentional burns, renovations, anything that requires to be or a notification uh, requires 10 working days prior to the beginning of it, even if there is no demo for a demo or even if there is no asbestos for a demolition. Uh, renovations uh, are a little different. 
Where am I here? Oh yeah, okay. Sorry, it's been a few months since I gave this thing. <laughs> I think I already went over all this. So category one, non-friable ACM, which would be your floor tile, asphalt building products, uh, things that are generally pretty safe because the asbestos is contained in some kind of uh, you know, sealant. If that becomes sand, if you sand it, grind it, cut it, any, with any kind of abrasive material, technically we consider that friable now. So if I walk into a, an, an inspection where the abatement contractor is removing vinyl floor tile with a, with a floor sander, you're in big trouble. I mean, you're not only you with me, but also with the Myosha guy, because typically they're not wearing proper uh, <coughs> protective gear for that kind of stuff. Uh, category two non-friable, like I mentioned before, that's typically transite siding, which I don't know if any of you are, some of you are familiar with, I'm sure. It's, it looks like cement board uh, siding. Usually comes in, I think they're three foot by maybe a foot and a half in pieces. Uh, very brittle. Um, it's very durable uh, if it stays on the house and it doesn't become impacted by some kind of hailstorm or something like that. Uh, it's actually a great material until it starts to become disturbed and then it gets brittle and it starts to fall apart. Automatically, as soon as transite siding is broken, it, we consider that friable. So, Contractors have a really hard time dealing with this sometimes because it is not easy to remove. Uh, it's, it's difficult to take off the house. You basically have to start from the top, pull the nails out, and remove each piece one at a time. It can take quite a long time. It's pretty labor intensive. Uh, like I said, non-friable becomes friable when it's in poor condition. Uh, it's being sanded, ground. Uh, you take an abrasive to it. A lot of times on older buildings with even category one asphalt roofing products, which are usually fairly pliable, your sealants, uh, rubber material, that stuff can get really dried out on an older building. It gets really desiccated and you can actually go up and crack this stuff uh, to the point where it's not even pliable anymore, it's just brittle. We do consider that friable at that point, um, which sometimes we get contractors arguing with us about it because they want it to go to the dump. You know, it's easier for them to send this stuff to the dump than abate it. So a lot of times I have to get up on roofs, you know, with the ladder and make sure the stuff's actually pliable uh, because it can go with the demolition. It doesn't have to be abated if it is pliable. Uh, but if it is brittle, technically it's friable. It has to be abated first. Pretty straightforward. The asbestos has to be removed from the building prior to any activity. Uh, for, I guess we're on the types of notifications here. There's the planned renovation. Uh, which, as we exp I explained before, it's the removal of any regulated asbestos-containing material that's going to be disturbed. Requires 10 working day notification. Not calendar day, it's working day. This can also be very confusing to contractors and government entities, anyone that's a homeowner or structure owner. Uh, emergency renovations, those are an exception. They do not require a 10 day, a 10 working day notification. Uh, we don't see these very often. They're pretty rare. Most of the time we see them, it's in a heavy industry setting like a paper mill or some kind of manufacturing plant where there's, they're operating 24 seven and they've got a lot of steam lines and you got a break in your steam line. Um, you can't, you can't wait that 10 working days because um, it's either going to impact your staff or it's going to impact the, or the impact the safety of your staff or it's going to impact your, 
your business to the point where it becomes detrimental to wait that 10 working days. Most places you can't just shut it down, like for a paper mill, you can't just shut the whole thing down, wait 10 days uh, for us to show up. So most paper, a lot of paper mills actually will put in a notification once a year uh, because this does happen a lot in paper mills. Uh, so they'll just submit a notification at the beginning of the year uh, saying that in case we do have an emergency renovation, here's our initial paperwork. When it happens, because it will happen, uh, we will call you and let you know exactly what's going on. Scheduled demolitions, talked about that earlier, requires the 10-day working day notification, even if there is no asbestos. Ordered demolition, that is also another exception. Uh, this requires some kind of government entity to actually, uh, uh, I guess, condemn a building, uh, be it government, health department, uh, it has to be somebody, some, some organization of official capacity. Uh, and we do require a notification. Uh, they don't have to wait the 10 working days, but they do have to file a notification. Uh, along with the notification, though, we do require a written copy of either the meeting minutes or a letter that was uh, uh, written by a building inspector, something that is proof that there is actually an ordered demo. Um, doesn't happen too often, but it did just happen recently uh, outside Marquette, where I am. This was just a couple weeks ago, uh, and these can be <laughs> these can be controversial too. This is a historic building that uh, the city of Nagani had been fighting with the owner for I think ten years, and they had ordered this thing condemned like half a dozen times, but the owner kept holding it up in court. Uh, because he thought he could save it and he thought he could save it and uh, finally it just got to the point where it was about to fall on the neighboring building which was a bar uh, <laughs> could have been really bad but it wasn't the, basically the owner got really lucky uh, the judge finally threw the book at him and said sorry we're we're tearing it down so even though they don't require a 10-day notification sometimes it can sometimes it can take years <laughs> It don't happen as fast as you want it to. Uh, the waste handling side of asbestos, um, it has to go to a type two uh, landfill. Unless it's non-friable, then it can go to a type three landfill, which typically only applies to industry. Type three landfills, we usually only see uh, uh, in an industry setting, like paper mills have their own type three landfill. Uh, it's pretty rare. I mean, most of the time they just send it to the regular landfill anyway. Uh, I work with the waste folks a lot uh, in land for landfilling. <coughs> they have to be licensed to accept waste, uh, asbestos waste. And they have to choose to accept asbestos waste. And almost every landfill I work with requires 24 hours of notice before you bring in a load of asbestos. And the reason for that is because every asbestos load that comes in has to be geo-referenced, uh, latitude, longitude, and depth. So they know exactly where that asbestos is deposited within the cell, within that landfill, in case they have to go back in at a later date and put in monitoring wells or some kind of gas collection system. They know exactly where that asbestos is. So you don't get a guy running a drill rig, punching holes through bags of uh, thermal insulation. That's a worker safety issue, really. As I mentioned before, uh, DLORA is the other regulatory agency. Our rules can conflict at times. Uh, it does get a little confusing for people that are new. They do not supersede each other. They are equally important. You must comply with both rules. Uh, so it's suggested if you're confused, contact both of us, <laughs> which happens a lot. I work pretty closely with uh, my OSHA guys. Um, if I see something going on at a job site, if I see some kind of worker protection issue, 
uh, that I find very questionable, I will contact the Myosha guys, and vice versa. If they're on site and they see uh, issues with the removal or waste handling side of it, they call me. So we work pretty closely together. Uh, as I mentioned, they do primarily worker protection. I do uh, prevention of emissions by either waste handling or removal practices. As I mentioned before, DLORA can handle private residential homes if there's a hired contractor. They do not do anything with waste handling. Uh, that's all me. So where do you start? Uh, like we mentioned before, is it applicable? Um, is your structure applicable? Which basically means is it commercial, industrial? Is it, is it non-residential? If it is residential, are there four or more dwelling units? Uh, this is some pictures of just some examples here. And this is a picture of some pipe wrap. Or uh, I mean, uh, not pipe wrap, but mud. I guess it's the, I'm having a loss for words at the moment. <laughs> this would be the, the mud that uh, they use on elbows and joints for thermal system insulation. Uh, typically on the older stuff, it's almost always hot. Uh, and this is in really bad shape. So it's a good thing this person is wearing a Tyvek suit with their PPE on. Um, who can conduct an asbestos survey? Uh, the NESHAP doesn't really specify that you have to be trained. Um, it's kind of a gray area. It gets frustrating at times. Um, you can be uh, trained, though, under the OSHA standards, which is highly recommended. Uh, where do you start with your building? Well, if it's going to be a demolition, you can start knocking holes in the walls. Uh, that's always fun, as long as you sample the drywall first <laughs> to make sure it's not asbestos containing. So typically, yeah, you just go through the house to cut holes in the walls, ceilings, whatever. Um, sample anything that looks suspect, uh, which you'll see later. It could be anything, really. Uh, asbestos isn't a lot of materials. The Asbestos Niche App, my program, does not have a cutoff date. Uh, we require notifications and samplings for buildings that were built a month ago. Uh, the D Laura, and th this is something that I, I think they can make exceptions to if they find a reason. But typically, uh, Myosha, D Laura, their cutoff dates, I think, I want to say 1981 or 82, typically. Um, but as I said, you can still find asbestos containing material in many buildings after that date. Uh, if the project is subject, you got to do your 10 working day notice. Um, my program, the niche app, we hold liable the, not just the contractor or the operator, but also the facility owner. So when I have to send out a violation notice, it, there's two. One goes to the property owner and one goes to the contractor. And I, you, both entities have to respond appropriately. You can't just get a response from one. Where can it be found? Siding, piping, ceilings, floors, many, many other things. Oh, did you do that, Jen? Yes. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so here's the Transite siding I was talking about earlier. Uh, it is really great stuff. If you get a house that has it on there, I would leave it, um, unless you don't like the way it looks. But really durable. Um, the problem is when you get stuff like this, uh, it starts breaking apart. You get that whole stuff along the bottom here. This stuff is, that's bad. That's really bad. Um, and then this can be a double whammy. There's probably lead paint on this. And it's hiding all the time. So you get facades or stuff like this where you know, it looks innocent enough, but then when you get behind it, what is this stuff actually mounted on? It's mounted on transite board or, or uh, transite 
paneling, which is great building material. Uh, it just has asbestos in it. This is something that we don't see too much, but it's kind of a unique material. It's called galbestos. Uh, it looks like galvanized, corrugated galvanized uh, paneling, but it's not. It's actually transite, and it's very brittle. The only time I've ever seen this is in an old maintenance shops. Um, basically, it's a great fire barrier uh, between areas that are using lots of solvents and other areas. This is the one most people know about. This is your thermal system insulation. Uh, it's easy to tell because it's got this corrugated cardboard look when you do a cross section of it. Um, this stuff is almost always guaranteed asbestos. Uh, nowadays, a lot of the stuff that's been abated, they replaced with fiberglass. Uh, but interesting thing about the fiberglass thermal system insulation is uh, the fiberglass itself is not asbestos containing, of course, but a lot of times they put this uh, really thin tar paper around the pipe and then they put the fiberglass. The tar paper is almost always asbestos containing. So even if it's fiberglass, you can still have uh, asbestos containing material on there underneath of it. So I see this a lot in old buildings. This is when you walk in the door and you walk right back out and you go get your respirator and you put on your Tyvek suit <laughs> because this is not good. Uh, here's some ceiling. This is popcorn ceiling. Uh, really popular during the 70s and 80s. Um, not all of it, but a good portion of it is uh, hot. It's pretty easy to remove actually. Uh, you can, I think you can use steam and just a scraper, but if you have to do it in your own home, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, floor tile, this is, this is where floor tile goes from non-friable to friable. Uh, this stuff is obviously pretty brittle, it's broken apart, it's desiccated and dry. Uh, you'd be surprised how quickly that can happen, even in a building that's only been abandoned for uh, two years. Uh, if it hasn't been heated, if there was water damage during that time, uh, you'd be amazed how quickly that floor tile can go from being pliable to really brittle. Um, and I've worked in, actually it was a Department of Corrections facility that was being torn down, uh, and it had only been vacant for two years, I think. And I walked into there, walked into the gymnasium, because this was a, uh, it was a minimum security center. And contractors in there driving over all this brittle floor tile oh. with uh, a high lift. And he's just rolling across the gym and all you can hear is snap, snap, crack, 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 crack. And I'm just like, uh, okay, we got a problem. Uh, this is the mastic that they use sometimes to put vinyl flooring over hardwood or any other solid surface like concrete. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but it's this black looking stuff here. Um, that stuff can have asbestos in it as well. So it's not just the actual floor covering, it can be the adhesives that they use to put that floor covering down. Uh, this is another common one that uh, contractors or consultants miss a lot. Um, old electrical boxes, these panels in the back, uh, sometimes they were transite. Uh, this is a, this is an interesting one. Uh, this is where window glazing becomes an issue. Uh, a lot of times, well man, uh, probably almost all older windows, the glazing is, is hot. Uh, the, window glazing was is it's pretty high for asbestos um, the interesting part is though we measure it in linear feet so you have to have a lot of windows before it triggers the niche app so we typically only see this in like giant old warehouses that are being torn down when you say window 
No, the actual uh, caulking, caulking around the window that hold that seals the between the pane and the frame. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, not not like a film on the glass. This is actually the the material that you know goes between the window and the frame along the edges here. But like I said, we measure that in linear feet, and you need 160 or uh, 260 linear feet before it requires the knee shaft. So <laughs> you square feet or uh, linear feet? No, I'm, I'm linear feet. Yeah. Okay. So. Well, that is where this gets interesting because you have to take the width of the glazing yeah. and basically do a lot of mathing, come out with an equation that shows that oh. you're going to be below that threshold. So usually it's about a quarter inch wide, and then you add up all of your windows. Yeah. So we don't see it too often. Um, but like I mentioned, Myosha has different rules, and they don't have a threshold for that. So while I might not get a notification for it because it doesn't meet my thresholds, Myosha always does. Because if they, Myosha walks onto a site and sees them removing windows like this with uh, uh, friable window glazing, then the contractors get in trouble. Uh, this is vermiculite. This has been a recent uh, touchy subject. Uh, why is it touchy? Because we have a lot of instances where vermiculite tests positive for asbestos um, because they were mined so closely together. In fact, a lot of times they were pulled out of the same pits. Uh, vermiculite's another mineral. Um, in fact, one of the more common sources of vermiculite was the Libby mine out of Montana, which is famous for uh, asbestos worker protection because that's essentially what started uh, all of our myosha protection in the United States was because of the employees of the Libby mine and their families were all, uh, many of them were inundated with mesothelioma and asbestosis. Um, so a lot of this vermiculite comes out of the Libby mine. The problem with vermiculite is that there is no real good test. Uh, there's no guaranteed test right now uh, to prove that it is asbestos containing. And we have a hard, we're, we have a hard time getting EPA to definitively say that all vermiculite is asbestos containing material. Um, but EPA will send, basically all their uh, correspondence with us, it comes down to highly recommended, highly recommended to abate, highly recommended. So while you can't test for it correctly, um, or accurately, I should say, uh, as DEQ asbestos program, we're working with contractors to make sure that it is removed as asbestos containing material. Um, we do get some pushback on that because it is uh, cost prohibitive. Um, it's not easy to handle either. A lot of times you got to use a VAC truck or a VEC loader with a HEPA filter on it and get in there and literally vacuum it all out. And a lot of times you can find it in cinder block walls where they actually pour it down inside the walls as they're building it. Uh, those can be very difficult to remove. No, this is an attic, um, which is more typical where you'd see it. You'd see it mostly in attic spaces like this uh, or inside a wall cavity of a stick frame house. The cinder black one is kind of a rare one, but it, they are out there. So it can't be tested? Pardon? You said it can't be tested. No, it can be tested, but there's flaws in all the tests they have right now. Uh, there's three kinds of tests, uh, and EPA will not, they won't settle on a single one. Uh, they've, been <laughs> they've been saying for about 15 years now that they're going to come out with a test method, and they, they have not. So yeah, it takes a very large bulk sample, yeah. And, and it depends on where you sample. 
Right, and it depends on where you sample from. So if it's in a wall cavity, are you sampling from the bottom of the wall cavity or are you sampling from the top of the wall cavity? Um, because you're going to have some settling there no matter what. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of discrepancies in the sampling method and the test methods. How about um, the disposal of that? Disposal, disposal, it's treated as a friable, so it goes, to, it, it goes as friable waste to the landfill. Mm hmm Yeah. Actually, this is, that's an educational thing I need to work with more on landfill operators, is getting them to recognize this vermiculite as it comes in. But we're getting there. Uh, what do we want you to do? Well, if you're an agency that issues permits, uh, we would like you to take our handouts and combine them with your own. Uh, not combine, but I guess uh, hand them out to your contractors as well as your own. Um, and I have all that information. Jen's got most of that information as well. Um, we have a pretty good uh, frequently asked questions pamphlet um, that basically gives the whole rundown of the Niche App program and uh, how we operate and what we do and what you would have to do to file a notification. So it's a really good thing to give to your contractors uh, if you work for a building department or something of that nature, or you are a consultant, we can definitely provide you with any of that information. Uh, I did have a checklist at one time. Uh, it needs revised though, so I'm working on that one. And then uh, if anybody has questions, please contact one of us. Uh, I'm only a part-time asbestos inspector. It's 20% of my job, uh, which doesn't sound like a lot, but given the vast size of my area, which is the whole UP and uh, kind of from Lansing North, uh, it, it can get pretty, pretty busy, especially during the summer months. But we, all of us have cell phones. You can contact any of us at any time during the week, uh, even if we're in the field. Uh, so Kim Dome, she is our, our notification system guru out of Lansing. Uh, she's typically never in the field, but she's the one that will handle any of your notification requirements with our online notification system. Uh, I handle UP Northern Lower. Uh, we've got two inspectors out of Lansing, Craig Decky and Jeremiah Brown. Uh, they handle basically, they split actually some of the northern lower with me. Um, occasionally, like for Traverse City area, you could see either myself or Craig or Jeremy up here. Uh, they, they also have a very large area to cover. And then because of all the blight remediation going on in the Detroit in area in southeast Michigan, we have two dedicated asbestos personnel based out of the Detroit office. Uh, and that's Tammy Bell and Joe Gattake. Um Even if you're not in their area uh, and you have a question and you can't get a, like say you have a question about a project in the UP, if you can't get a hold of me for some reason, you can call any of these people. They, we all have the same knowledge base and I handle questions all the time from Lower Michigan for contractors. Um, this is our website, it's pretty easy, uh, at least to get to the main AQD website. This is, that's still accurate, right? Okay. <laughs> Michigan.gov slash air, pretty easy. Uh, and then once you're on that main page, there's, I think it's on the, yeah, the bottom or on the right side, or both. both. Yeah, on the bottom and on the right side of the main AQD page are uh, links to the Niche App program, which once you click on that, it'll take you to uh, all the notification requirements and the actual notification system. Uh, we have a new asbestos notification system. It's pretty user friendly. Uh, it just came online about a year ago. Much more user friendly than the old one. Um, this one, it, it's, it's very easy to work with. Um, I think that's about it. If you need to get a hold of anybody in DLORA, here's their hotline. Uh, that's about it. Anybody got any questions?